All right, welcome back to biology. Again, my name is Mr. Kowalski. Uh, today we're going to be doing part two of our notes that we started last time about biochemistry. Uh, last time we talked about uh, organic compounds and carbohydrates. Today we're going to talk about lipids and proteins. Remember, there is a fourth one, nucleic acids, uh, but we're really not going to talk much about them in this unit other than to say what they were, and we talked about that in the last uh, set of notes. But we're going to talk a lot about nucleic acids when we talk about DNA at the end of the semester, okay? So I'll put myself to the side here, and we will move on. Okay. So what are lipids? <laughs> know the fats, or they will break your heart. Exactly. Okay. So again, we're going to start with building blocks here. Okay, the building block of a lipid is known as a fatty acid. What would you call me? Yeah, you heard me. Okay. Yeah, fatty acid. Fatty acids are actually these little tails here hanging off the ends of these little circles. Okay. Uh, the circles represent glycerol heads, which have a charge, and then we have three fatty acid chains on each of these. Okay, now you'll notice there's a difference. One of them has straight chains, and one of them has kinked chains. We'll talk about how those are different a little later on. Characteristics, it is nonpolar. It has one end that has a charge. It has another end that does not, so it is nonpolar. You need two poles, a, a positive and a negative, in order to be uh, polar. So this means that it does not mix with water. That's an important characteristic because it makes them easy to identify. Uh, they're made of also carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, just like carbohydrates, uh, but they're in no ratio. And that should make sense because you should already know a little bit about lipids from what we talked about last time. These are fats, so these are for energy storage. So that mean, that would mean that, uh, and again, there's fats, oils, waxes, and phospholipids there. But that would mean that these fats have to be made out of whatever we use for energy, which is carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are made of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So, therefore, these must be made out of the same type of thing, okay? So, if you'll remember, whatever we don't use here from our sugars, our glucoses and fructose and stuff like that, a lot of that will get stored in our muscles as glycogen, but then anything extra we store as fat for later, okay? So, but again, there's no ratio. It's no C6H12O6 or anything like that. It's just C's, H's, and O's. Uh, functions of lipids, uh, they make up the cell membrane. That's what these phospholipids right here are. Uh, they are the cell membrane. We'll talk more about those next month. <clears throat> uh, insulation from the cold. Obviously, you know that larger animals that live like in the Arctic or the Antarctic, they have layers of blubber, which is fat, and that helps to insulate them. Uh, it stores long-term energy. That is, I mean, that's the whole point of us having fat in the first place. <clears throat> but it's also a shock absorber. You could never get to the point where you had no fat whatsoever in your body because your your um, Organs would be at risk because actually if you think about your kidneys and where they're located in your lower back Okay, your kidneys are located like right from this general vicinity back here in your back Okay, there's no bone or anything there to protect them So around your kidneys you have a layer of fat that actually protects them same thing with your heart uh, Obviously the bigger you are the more fat you're gonna have and it's not gonna be good for your heart But having that little bit of fat there to help protect it is not necessarily a bad thing So it's a shock absorber for internal organs so there's two types of fats. There's good fats and bad fats. And then even in the bad fats, there's two different types. And you can see our friend trans and sad here. Don't let them break your heart. So saturated and trans fats are the bad guys. Saturated fats are the fats that are hanging on us right now. They're animal fat. They're solid at room temperature. Uh, you can probably picture like when you have steak or chicken or stuff like that. And you can see the, the white or the yellowy stuff uh, that are hanging on the sides of it. Uh, that is fat. Um, actually, a little tool for you in the future, when you go to grill your steaks and things like that, you're actually supposed to cook it until the fat in the middle actually melts. Uh, that helps it, gives it that flavor. But fat usually has a really good flavor, which is a problem for us because we like to eat fatty foods because they taste good, uh, which makes sense because they're filled with the leftover carbohydrates that we didn't end up using. Uh, so that's why uh, solid fats can be so dangerous because they have such an appealing taste to us because your body recognizes them as energy storage molecules, okay? So it's solid at room temperature, and when we say it's saturated, what that means is that for every carbon in our chain here, so fatty acids are long chains of carbon, we said, so for every link in that chain, it has hydrogens filling up all of its valences, so it has a completely full valence shell. Trans fats are actually man-made. These do not occur in nature, and what we do is we actually take hydrogens out, and we can make their chains still straight 
this is like I said, this is a polyunsaturated fat. We can make them still have straight chains even after removing those H's, but we have to do it in a lab because in nature it doesn't just happen like that. And I'll show you what I mean here in a second. The reason we do that is because as you can read down here, it makes things more stable over a long period of time, so it increases the shelf life of foods. Well, the problem is these trans fats are really, really bad for you. They lead to, um, and again, here's our animal fat, but they lead to heart disease. Uh, the trans fats and, and saturated fats increase your bad cholesterol levels, your LDLs, and that increases your risk of heart disease. We'll talk a little bit about heart attacks in class. Uh, my father actually had a, a large heart attack a few years ago, had to have a quintuple bypass. And what that meant was that he had blockages in five different places. You can see the deposits here of what we call plaque, all right, of this cholesterol that starts to build up, and it actually closes off these arteries in, uh, to your heart. Now, remember, your heart's a large muscle, so it needs a blood supply, too. So when you think heart attack, you probably think that it's something inside the heart. Well, actually, it's the outside. It's these arteries that are bringing blood to this muscle. If the blood doesn't get there, that muscle starts to die, and that's what causes a heart attack. Well, let's talk about the good guys. Not all fats are bad, believe it or not. Some of them are actually really good for you. They're known as unsaturated fats. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about them on news and commercials lately. You hear about those omega-3 fatty acids and how you're supposed to take fish oil pills and stuff like that. That's because these are really good for you. They help reduce the numbers of LDL. They are actually the HDL. They help to reduce that bad cholesterol. Uh, they are missing hydrogens, just like the trans fats. But you'll notice instead of being straight chains, now they're kinked. We call them kinky. <laughs> they have kinks in their shape. And that a lot doesn't allow them to lay flat on top of each other. So if you can imagine, saturated fats and trans fats can just lay right on top of each other and then just pile up, and that's what makes them solid <clears throat> or those weird, weird liquids, okay? Tra uh, unsaturated fats are kinked, so they can't just lay on top of each other, so they end up bouncing off each other, and that's a characteristic of a liquid. So that's why these are oils at room temperature. So to review, lipids are made of CH and O. Lipids do not mix with H2O because they are nonpolar. They're made of, <laughs> again, CH and O. I think this one must have meant fatty acids. That's the building block. The three types are saturated, unsaturated, and trans. And the good one is unsaturated. Okay. Real quick, let's talk about protein. Okay. Uh, the building block of a protein are amino acids. And yes, you need to draw this picture down here. Okay. There's 22 different types of amino acid. Okay. But most of the amino acids stay the same. There's only one part that changes. They're made of that CH and O again, but now we've added another element. Here is N, nitrogen. Nitrogen is very important for living things because we can't build protein without it. Uh, there's five parts of the amino acid. Like I said, there's central carbon, so we always start with a C. And we learned the other day that carbon has four valence electrons, so that means it can make four bonds. So we'll draw four lines around the outside of it. We have our carboxyl group, which is carbon and two oxygens. But you'll notice there's a double bond between this carbon and oxygen and then it gives it a negative charge over here. So the carboxyl end is negative. On the other end is the amino group, NH3, which has a positive charge. So you could see how the carboxyls and the aminos would actually end up linking together. And then you can see where we get the name amino acid, amino acid. There's a free hydrogen attached to the top of that central carbon. And then there's something called the R group. The R is a variable. There are different types of compounds that we can attach here. There's 22 different occurring in nature, and then we can actually make some in labs too. But depending on what that R group is, we'll determine what the function of this amino acid is. Now, characteristics of protein, they're usually flexible material. I know you're going to say, oh, well, bones aren't flexible. True, okay, but for the most part, they're flexible, though bones have special things that occur in them that you can learn about in anatomy class. Uh, most animal and fungi tissues are made of proteins. They contain, again, CHONN. And their name usually ends with an in. For example, keratin, hemoglobin, okay, that's like the stuff inside your red blood cells that carries oxygen. Insulin, you've heard about, and it has associated with diabetes and things like that, okay. But what are the functions of proteins? Well, there's seven of them that we need to know, okay. First of all, they build structures. For example, elastin, collagen, keratin, okay. These all help build uh, tissues, fingernails, skin, uh, connective tissues, etc storage okay and food energy remember i told you in class today that we can actually use some proteins for energy as a last resort transport to move other substances i mentioned hemoglobin that transports oxygen via the red blood cell and then we'll talk more about cell membrane proteins when we get to that point in the unit or in the next unit uh, helps coordinate body activities like insulin whether to absorb sugars and, and help rebuild muscle 
Uh, contract and move, act in, and myosin. You'll notice the ins keep occurring here. Uh, you'll talk a ton about those when you take anatomy and physiology. Uh, help fight disease, antibodies. Okay, antibodies obviously are made of protein. And then they help control chemical reactions inside the body. These are known as enzymes. And you'll notice the names have changed. They're no longer ins at the end. They're aces. We will talk much more about that in the next uh, section. Okay. So just to review, make sure you can answer these four key questions for lipids and three key questions for proteins. I uh, hope you picked something up. Again, there's lots of vocabulary, so take your time. Go back and review. Uh, again, if you have questions, please feel free to contact me, jkabuski at gocathedral.com, or visit the website, mrkabuski.wordpress.com. Have a great day.